Greetings all, this is Harry Nick back again to have another chat about X-Wing 2nd Edition. Because in the last three videos we had a look through the various articles detailing all the new stuff for the various factions, but there is a still a bunch of different things that have been revealed through interviews and demos and all that kind of stuff. A bunch of stuff that didn't quite fit in those videos, and I just want to make sure I covered everything before we move forward. And just before we dive into these, I do want to mention, yes, there has been a few things that have been talked about here and there in a various interview. Um, for example, we have Emperor Palpatine, which grants force tokens, and then friendly ships can use those force tokens, kind of like the effect you always had. But we don't have that reveal properly, so I'm not going to talk about that stuff just yet. We have a good four months before this game comes out, so there's no point rushing to do that kind of stuff. Better to do it right than to do it quickly, I say. And also, even though, yes, I did go through this before, we also had revealed uh, the alternate art cards that are going to be prizes at the European and American Championships. And this is Darth Vader, um, which is a card we already detailed before, but it is really cool to see it properly laid out for us here. And we also had revealed the Tempest Squadron pilot, uh, which is just a basic uh, tie advanced initiative two, nothing too crazy. Um, this guy never saw play in the original version of X-Wing, but it is worth noting, um, on these ace platforms, what FFG want to be doing is to give aces a higher costing or higher priority so that it makes these guys more, more competitive. So what we saw previously in X-Wing was usually a linear scale from bottom to highest. You're usually paying for the pilot skill, but because of the platform, like the tie advance, for example, you generally want to make sure you get the highest pilot skill possible. And Vader's ability, both in the first and second edition, really lends itself to ace-like maneuvers. And once more before we dive into anything else, we're just going to go through a couple of things that I missed in the previous videos. This is a TIE Fighter pilot that was detailed in the original reveal article. Iden vs. CO Initiative 4. Before a friendly TIE LN fighter at range 0 to 1 would suffer one or more damage, you may spend one of your energy. If you do, prevent that damage damage and he comes with one energy and this is really really cool uh, on the face of it it seems like an initiative four tie with essentially four hull um basically you can treat it as three hull plus he gets one more hit he can use that on himself uh being that he's range zero to one uh, that seems to be the language that's being used from this point on if it's from range zero it can be something that you're touching or it can be yourself but what's really cool about this is that extra point of damage, that extra hull is very, very flexible. Uh, it basically means that this is a base level TIE fighter with four hull, except one of its hull can be shared across all these other TIE fighters. And that's really relevant. I actually quite like that. In fact, you could say it's a virtual four, five, six hull, because of course it can prevent more than one point of damage. And being able to do that flexibly across all your TIE Fighters really makes sense. I get the impression that FFG are really pushing for squadron formations when it comes to TIE Fighters, and this just makes perfect sense to me. Also revealed in the Rebel article was this spread here, and I did miss one little detail. And thank you for each of the people that pointed this out in the comments section. The dials right here, the one on the right hand side has a reverse maneuver. And previously in the first edition of X-Wing, only one ship has reversed, and that's the Quad Jumper, and that's on the Scum Faction. And having a look at this, I thought, oh, what could this be? It's probably not going to be one of the core fighters, the A, B, E, K, X, Y, or Zs. I don't think it's going to be any of them because they're really geared towards combat and maneuverability and being able to move backwards doesn't seem likely. My first thought was this is going to be the Hawk. And having a look at this, well, this would be a pretty big upgrade on the Hawk dial. Not only are those three banks turned white, he also has three hard reds, and it's been given a K turn. And look, maybe the Hawk will get a massive dial upgrade. We don't know, but I kind of doubt it. It's really not what the Hawk is about. What I theorize this is, this is the Sheathapede dial. And if you have a look at it, you can see that all these maneuvers match up apart from that one reverse. And on one hand, I think, well, the Sheathapede's a really new ship. It's really dominant in the current meta. I don't really feel like it needs a bit of a push. But on the other hand, a one reverse makes perfect sense. It needs that one reverse to park itself on the ghost. Uh, because that is the orientation it's facing when it docked the ghost. Which leads me to think there may be some kind of mechanic to redock the Phantom with the ghost. That'd be really, really interesting. Just speculation at this stage, but based on that one reverse maneuver, it did get me thinking. And it is worth looking into when we get the Phantoms revealed later on. 
All right, and let's move on to some new stuff. First up, we have Shield Upgrade. Now, this functions exactly the same as it did before. It's a modification that increases its ship's shield value by one. But what's cool about it, it's been neatened up. Um, that block of text is just flavor text, in case you guys are wondering. It doesn't actually have any impact on the game. It's not rules text. But what we do have is this little plus one shield. And this is the kind of language that's used often in trading card games. It's a great, neat way of conveying uh, additions or subtractions from some of the ship's core values. And it's just basic and straightforward. It means you don't have to read a block of text. You can see it clearly on the card. And that's fantastic. I like that they've made this change. And we also have the updated version of Stealth Device. It comes with one energy while you defend. If your energy is active, which I assume means if it has the energy token on the card, roll one additional defense dice. After you suffer damage, you lose one energy. And this is basically the same way Stealth Device always worked. Uh, instead of discarding, use up the energy token, which is great because it means this card's always face up. It means all the cards that previously discarded are always face up, so you can always remember what you have. There is one key difference with this version of Stealth Device, though. It discards or loses its energy or whatever when you take damage, and that's very significant because previously, uh, things like asteroids and bombs could not remove the Stealth Device. And uh, that never really sat well with me. I kind of feel like, yes, look, bombing is really powerful in the meta right now, but moving into second edition, it might not be. And Stealth Device was always a great way of blanking bombs because it was a tool that you had, which is meant to give you downside if the ship takes damage, but if it's not hit by an attack or there's incidental damage, that never happens. I think this approach to Stealth Device makes a bit more sense. And look, if you guys think that's unfair, if you guys think that, that hey, that nerfs the card too much, remember we don't have the costing yet. This could be dialed back. The equivalent of first edition would mean this costs six points. Maybe it'll cost four or five points to make up for the downside. Who knows? We will see moving forward, but in essence, I like the changes being made here. And one last modification card we have here is Afterburners. Now, I don't have a good shot of this card. It was revealed in one of the demos, specifically the Bell of Lost Souls demo, and we didn't get any good shots of the card. So I'm just gonna write out the text here. Um, the card next to it here is Auto Thrusters. That is the card it was originally based off of. Afterburners comes with two energy. After you fully execute a speed three to five maneuver, you may spend one energy to perform a boost action even while stressed. And you can see clearly that this is playing around with the same kind of design space as Auto Thrust. And in fact, it actually uses the same art as well. This is about giving highly maneuverable aces a tool to help them defend better. Obviously, if you're doing three or five speed maneuvers and you want to boost, it's probably going to be to get away from your foe. I mean, well, it, it could be to force them into range one and potentially arc dodge, but that's not so likely with the boost. And I think uh, honing in on that maneuverability is a better way of approaching auto thrusters. Now we know that auto thrusters is going to be hard baked into the tie interceptors. We will see all that when that's revealed. So look guys, auto thrusters is still in the game, but you just can't put on every single ace now. And I think in terms of jousting, in terms of dogfighting, afterburners is probably going to do a similar kind of thing, but it's going to be more conducive to that style of play, which gets a big thumbs up for me. All right, let's move across to a couple of systems cards. We have a copy of Advanced Senses here. After you reveal your dial, you may perform one action. If you do, you cannot perform another action during your activation. And this is really interesting and a little bit disappointing, actually. Um, first of all, I love that it says after you reveal your dial and not before you reveal your dial, because we've all been in that situation with Advanced Senses where we accidentally reveal our dial and then we can't use it. So that's a nice little update there. There's no reason why it should be before or after. If it's after, it just means that you get the option to do it even if you accidentally skipped a step which you shouldn't have. Um, it's always before you move. I mean, that's the key to advanced sense. But what's worth noting here is if you do, you cannot perform another action during your activation. Now, my understanding is that yes, once you've done this, once you've revealed your dial, that that is part of your activation. So unfortunately, this means you cannot use uh, the equivalent to push the limit. You can't do those red maneuvers. Uh, you can't use that extra action economy on this, which is a bit sad, but look at the same time advanced sensors and push limits was always a very powerful thing. So look, if you put this on, uh, say Darth Vader or something, unfortunately Vader cannot unlock this and push it even further. 
Uh, which makes sense. Uh, Vader actually never worked with the old advanced sensors either because Vader specifically said in its original version during the action step. So it could never interact with advanced sensors. This new one could have if this advanced sensor didn't have the stipulation. Perhaps that's why. Um, Vader seems like a pretty pushed card at the moment and perhaps they're just avoiding any really broken combos. So I can kind of see what's going on here. Look, advanced sensors is still cool. Being able to take an action before you move means you can still take an action and bump. It just means that you're not pushing it as far as you used to, like with the old robot build, how you used to advance sensors, push limit, bump into the other robot, that kind of stuff. That's not going to happen anymore. And that's probably a good thing. Also in the system slot, we have fire control systems. Way perform an attack. If you have a lock on the defender, you may reroll one attack die. If you do, you're not going to spend your lock during this attack, which is very similar design space as the original fire control system. It's about making your target locks hyper efficient. And actually at the core of it, it is functioning almost exactly the same way. It doesn't look like it on paper, but basically the concept with the original fire control system was basically you had free rerolls. Um, it never mattered about spending the target lock because you always got it back again. And this is just a little dialed back. You only get one reroll. And look, considering how utterly efficient fire control system used to be, this is probably a good light nerf that the card needed. And it means you can really capitalize off target locks as well. Uh, this I see being really powerful on the new TIE Advance because you always get that benefit with the TIE Advance of having target locks because the advanced targeting computer is baked onto the card. And if you combo it with this, it means you can keep those target locks and get extra, extra value, get that reroll and get that free conversion from a hit to a crit. Seems really good. I like the adjusted approach to this card a lot. All right, let's jump over to some talents because yes, elite pilot talents are now simply referred to as talents. This is Outmaneuver. Here pictured, we have the original version of the card. Again, we don't have a great shot of this one, so I've just written the text out. When you perform a forward arc attack, if you are not in the defender's firing arc, the defender rolls one fewer defense die, which is good. I feel like this is a restrained version of the original Outmaneuver. Um, the problem with the design around the original Outmaneuver is it really benefited ships with other firing arc. Um, big auxiliary firing arcs, uh, rear auxiliary firing arcs, 180 degree arcs, or maneuverable firing arcs like the Shadowcaster used to have. And that's really not what this is about. This is about dogfighting. This is about getting your ace, your highly maneuverable ship around the back of the defender. And I think given that that's what the design always was clearly meant to be, this is good because specifying your forward firing arc helps that. And yes, once again, this has had a slight nerf, so it may be costed a bit cheaper. Again, the equivalent would be six points, so maybe it's four or five points, we will see. But I do like how this has been neatened up. It feels like this is what the card should always have been doing in the first place. Also in the talent slot, we have Elusive. While you defend, you may spend one energy to re-roll one defense dice. After you fully execute a red maneuver, recover one energy, and the card comes with one energy. On the face of it, when I first saw this, I thought, well, hang on, I don't feel like this is a much better option than like action economy and that kind of stuff. But then I reminded myself, hey, push the limit is not going to be an option in the talent slot anymore. And from that point of view, uh, if the ship can really really push this concept of doing red maneuvers, um, anything with a talent roll, say your TIE Advanced, your T-70X Wing, uh, your TIE Advanced Prototype, your original X Wing, this seems like it's going to go a long way. And it's going to help those ships become better brawlers because they can just tank a few more shots, be a little bit more defensive, and that can prove really, really helpful. Especially if you have any way of cheating on focus tokens to your ship, which we know will exist in the game. It basically, it means you can reroll that die and really up the chances with that focus token to get consistent and evade results. And that feels really good to me. Again, this is going to come down to how much the card costs, but right off the bat, it seems really good. It seems to really play around with the natural ability of ships and my guess is ships with Talon Roll are going to love this card. All right, let's talk about a couple of Astromech cards. And before I get into this, I do want to point out, yes, these are now universal across the Scum and Rebel faction, which is really, really cool. I spoke about this before. Basically, the whole concept with Astromechs was uh, it never really should have been um, the way it was designed with Salvage Astromech as a completely different upgrade slot. But because the Scum Faction came later in the game and there was no printing on those original Rebel cards to say Rebel only, especially with those unique like R2-D2, they had to do that. Otherwise, you could have just fielded R2-D2 on the Scum Faction, which would have made no sense. So now they've neatened that out. Now Rebel and Scum get all the generic Astromech. Unless there is going to be Rebel or Scum specific Astromechs that are generic, but we'll see. That might happen down the track at some stage. 
This is R2 Astromech, comes with two energy. After you reveal your dial, you may spend one energy and gain one disarm token to recover one shield. Uh, good, this is repeatable regen, especially on scum, that's very, very significant. Uh, but it does only occur two times and you have to take disarm tokens. And what we can see here, um, between this and the new R2 and all that kind of stuff, is yes, regen is still going to be a thing, but they've really, really dialed it back because it was getting a bit oppressive towards the end of the first edition meta, so it's good to see. Um, good to see it's still in the game, I don't think it was ever a bad thing, I just think the power level was a bit of an issue. And we also have R4 Astromech, which actually actually uses the art of the R4 Agromech, an old salvaged Astromech card, but in concept takes the card text from the R2 Astromech. Decrease the difficulty of your speed 1 to 2 basic maneuvers, which is banks, turns, and straights. Uh, this is good. This is basically playing around with the idea of the old R2 Astromech that made all those maneuvers green, except reducing the difficulty means red become white and white become blue. And to me, that makes a whole lot more sense. Uh, there was always room for abuse with this, especially with the old Unhinged Astromech, which changed all the three speed maneuvers to green, um, because it meant that red maneuvers could become green, and that was really powerful, especially on the Scum Y-Wing. But more to the point, it also says basic maneuvers, which means you can't do Talon rolls, you can't do S-loops, which now these ships are free to have. The problem with these old cards, especially the Unhinged Astromech, was it was preventing ships that could take Astromechs from having special maneuvers at those speeds. Because if they did that, you could suddenly turn them green and do really, really broken stuff. It's the reason the Jumpmaster had S loops at two speed, because FFG stated we can't do it at three speed because it would be broken with Unhinged Astromech. So from a design standpoint, this is great. This really neatens things up and it leaves the designs of new ships and possibly existing ships a bit more space to breathe and explore some new concepts. We have a new crew card here in Perceptive Copilot. Actually takes the art from Hotshot Copilot, but in concept, this is a functional reprint of Recon Specialist. After you perform a focus action, gain one focus token. And good to note, it says gain one focus token instead of gain one additional focus token. And I theorize the main reason behind this is because there are theoretically situations where you take a focus action, but you wouldn't get the token. Uh, say your ship's jammed and you get rid of it immediately. This just neatens it up, says gain one focus token. Doesn't matter if that focus action uh, didn't garner a focus token in the first place, you always get this token from this card, which is really good. Again, we don't know about its costing yet, but it's pretty safe to assume it'll be around the same cost as Recon Spec. Uh, Recon Spec, to me, always felt really good at three points. Uh, a really powerful card, but, but three points I always felt was enough to make sure it wasn't always an auto-add in a lot of builds. Next up, we have a new missile card in Cluster Missiles. This is another reprint, um, but they've changed the concept behind it. The original Cluster Missiles did a double attack against one single target, but this one's interesting. This one actually spreads out its targets. It has a three red attack dice, forward facing firing arc, range one to two, just like the original. It comes with four energy or four shots. Attack target lock, spend one energy. After this attack, you may perform this attack as a bonus attack against a different target at range zero to one of the defender ignoring the target lock requirement. Now it's important to note, it says ignore the target lock requirement, it does not say ignore the range requirement, which means you need to have two targets in range one to two inside your forward facing firing arc. And it looks like you do have to spend the extra energy as well. So off the bat, it does seem like a bit more of, of a card that requires a bit more narrow use. There may be a uh, list that your opponent take like pal bases that just doesn't allow you to abuse this as much as you'd like. This is going to be good against swarms, but I don't think it's going to be super oppressive against swarms. Remember, there's going to be no extra munitions or guidance chips, so we can't push this card any further than it's already going unless um, the pilot gives it some kind of boost, like say Boba Fett or something like that. But I do like the idea of this spraying multiple targets. I always thought the original one with just two attacks against the same target just felt like one big attack, really. In my eyes, never felt too clustery. So again, I think the flavor really matches here and I think this is a better design for the card. We have a new force ability in Sense. Now, force abilities are going to be cards that take up the talent slot, but go on force sensitive pilots like Vader or Luke. This was again shown off in the Battle of Lost Souls demo. We didn't get a good shot of the card, so I've just written out the text here. During the system phase, which is a phase after you set your dials and before your ships activate, you may choose one ship at range zero to one and look at its dial. 
if you spend one force, you may choose a ship at range 0 to 3 instead. It's worth noting as well, this card grants you no extra force tokens, so be aware of that. It doesn't fuel itself, if that makes any sense. Um, for example, if this was on Vader, he'd have to balance out which tokens wants to go into this, well, which tokens want to go into the extra actions, and which tokens he wants to use to convert focus results. So there is always these factors to think about with these force tokens. But essentially what this is, is a functional reprint of Intelligence Agent, except it's been moved into a different slot altogether. And I think that makes a lot of sense. In Intel Agent, for one point in the crew slot, I always felt was very, very pushed, a very great, powerful card. And was always one of those things where if there was a crew slot left and I had one point in my list, I'd always take it because um, even in lists that can't abuse it, it's a good powerful card. In lists that can abuse it, like lists with bombs and boosts and barrel roll and repositioning, all that kind of fun stuff, it's really, really powerful. I always just love this card on Skirk Bombers. So look, it makes sense. Move it onto a more valuable upgrade slot. Make it play around with resources. Just make it a bit harder and less abusable to use. I think that's probably a good thing moving forward. And last but not least today, we have Fenrail. This was part of the prize package for Worlds. We got a first and second edition copy of this card, which is really, really cool. Um, this image here shows us, look, we already knew all this stuff from Fenrail. He gets an extra dice on offense and defense at range one. But what we didn't see before was the action bar of the Protector of Starfighter. Has all the same actions it used to have, except off the back of a boost or a barrel roll, it can take a red focus, which is really, really good. I like how we do have kind of a functional push the limits built into this, but it's not really pushed. Um, it is going to be really pushed on the tie of and A-Wing. We already know that the tie Scepter can basically do any maneuver off the back of a boost or barrel roll because that's basically what it wants to be doing. And the A-Wing plays around more with boosts. Where the Protectorate Starfighter cannot do a boost and a barrel roll together. Look, barrel roll and focus and boost and focus are both really good for this ship because it really plays into its offensive abilities. It means that it can fly super aggressively and still have a focus to use on offense or defense in a pinch as well. And one more thing I want to add, Concordia Faceoff. While you defend, if the attack is range one and you are inside the attacker's forward facing firing arc, change one result to an evade result. And this is interesting. I didn't realize this before, but this does not require the opponent to be in your forward facing firing arc. It does mean that you can't be in one of their side arcs or rear arcs. So yes, that is worth considering as well. But it's also worth noting on turreted ships um, in the forward facing firing arc, they may not even have a shot on you. So this is kind of a nerf and a buff in the same way. In my mind, this really pushes the Protector of Starfighter to fly the way it always wanted to fly. Its action bar really plays into that really aggressive style and Fenrau is going to be a lot of fun to play. Hopefully it's balanced out so Fenrau is functional again and hopefully the rest of the Fang Fighter pilots are also equally as excellent. And that's it for all this bonus stuff, guys. That's everything we have properly revealed up to this point. Over the next four months, yes, we're going to have a lot of stuff to sift through, but I look forward to it. Look forward to breaking it down for you guys. But in the meantime, thank you so much for all the kind words, all the views and everything, guys. This X-Wing 2nd Edition content I've been making has just had such a great response, and I cannot thank you enough. Hello to all my new subscribers. I hope you enjoyed the channel. In the meantime, like and subscribe. Like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter, and I will catch you guys later.